suffering a good deal with this heat. Um, and so uh, I can only imagine that sitting in a chair, um, you know, there are better ways to sedate yourselves on an afternoon like this. Um, park bench, frisbees, balls, um, bikes. So thank you so much, really, for, uh, for being here today. Um, I want to thank David, too, who's really, I think, put together a very nice um, sort of annual discussion series. And I'm not aware of any other organization on campus that um, puts together um, events like this so frequently throughout each semester and, and really gets, I think, a lot of people showing up, a lot of conversation. And it's a real service, I think, to the campus climate. So um, thanks to David for doing this and for, um, for dealing with me and not having always a very clear sense of when I could actually do this. Yeah. It's incredible. So, We're glad you're here now. Yeah. And Dr. Mudd, my friend and colleague in religious studies, um, is extraordinarily busy, but um, I appreciate him being here today. He's an expert in, in method in theology, especially from um, Bernard Lonergan. Uh, he's also an expert in ecclesiology. So in a sense, I'm dabbling in um, uh, you know, sandboxes that he um, either stays in all the time or has actually created himself. So uh, this is a great treat for me um, to be here and to, to get feedback from him, but also from um, those of you in the audience who offer it. This is um, a topic and a concern for me that's a growing edge. It's, it, what I'm going to speak about today is in no way ironclad, uh, conceptually airtight. Um, this is sort of where I'm thinking. This is sort of where I, I want to go, and only for the last uh, couple of years. Um, so this is really a growing edge for me, and I would welcome um, your feedback, both critical and um, uh, I'm happy with that in the case. So I think, as you can tell, uh, it, it may not be obvious why somebody like me, um, a white North American male, would uh, be presenting on a topic like this. Uh, why would I be looking at um, the Asian bishops in particular for uh, not just an example of good contextual theology? Uh, and by contextual theology, I simply mean theology that's done from local cultures, uh, that is responsive to local cultures. And which will, of course, use the resources from those cultures to, um, to do some of the articulation of what, what discipleship is, uh, how theology actually becomes meaningful. Um, so I, I just want to say, why is it that somebody like me would take interest? Um, and I, I think it has to do with the fact that when I first read this document, and it's quite long, um, it's about 100 pages, if you go onto the Socratic website and uh, download the PDF, it'll take all of your smartphone memories. <laughs> but uh, it's quite long. But I found myself really um, almost therapeutically released. There was some kind of a release that happened within my, my own intellect. Uh, I, I like to try to sort of get at how that could happen uh, today. Uh, why somebody who's not part of the Asian Christian communities uh, could still really find a lot of traction here with a document like this. And I'm happy to say that um, students who have been unfortunate to take my classes, um, a particular 200 level course called Christian Theologies of Religious Diversity, um, they've actually read short excerpts from this document, and I've been really gratified to see that they too have been shocked that bishops in the Catholic Church could produce this kind of literature. Um, so I think there's something here for us that, that merits, um, merits our, our attention. Okay, so I guess three major points I'd like to try to make today. First of all, to discuss the, um, what they describe as an Asian enculturated uh, interpretation of Christian theology. What are those markers? Secondly, they do this by grounding their thinking in the Second Vatican Council um, from the 1960s, 62 to 65. In particular, the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world, Gaudium et Spes. I'd like to try to talk about how they have received Gaudium et Spes and how they've constructed their enculturated theology uh, in connection with Gaudium et Spes. And then finally, toward the end, I'd like to just sort of gesture into some directions of how this might be offering universal uh, gifts right, to, the, to the global church, um, how the Asian bishops are offering gifts to the global church. 
But first of all, I think there are some uh, obstacles, right? There might be some obstacles to this kind of learning and receiving. Um, the Georgetown theologian Peter Fan, Vietnamese American theologian, um, has said this by way of talking about some of these obstacles. He has said that there is the danger that the dominant Euro American theology and the academic and ecclesiastical powers that support it will regard ethnic or minority theologies as at best an interesting but harmless exercise to be tolerated within a pluralistic context but without posing any challenge, uh, any challenge to itself. And at worst, a theological aberration to be suppressed. And there's some background here. Peter Fan himself um, has been looked into by Rome uh, and the US bishops. And uh, many Asian theologians have come under the, um, the gaze of uh, the Vatican. Right? So there's some subtext here. There's a lot of historical background to this. But the general sort of impression is that um, this is a marginalized uh, Christian community that the West largely pays little attention to, or when attention is paid, uh, very often there's, there's misunderstanding. They're not quite seen for what they're doing. So I think clearly there exists a need to open up some interpersonal space, both ecclesial and academic, in which the danger of which fans spoke can be avoided and replaced by a fruitful intercultural dialogue within the church. As distinct from the reality of multiculturalism, which refers to quantitative and descriptive, um, the, those facts, uh, the quantitative and descriptive fact of, of many cultures comprising the church, the phenomenon of an intercultural church is preferable, I want to suggest, uh, because intercultural includes connotations of mutuality and exchange uh, among those cultures in the church. Intercultural theology reflects an interest in the implications of cultural intersections and moments of encounter. It, uh, it attends, Jenna Cruz argues that it attends to the juxtaposition and interaction as well as to the tension and resistance when two or more cultures are brought together. And it pursues qualitative and evaluative forms of discourse not simply quantitative and descriptive. So intercultural Christian community. Uh, how is it that the Federation of Asian Bishops have actually received the Second Vatican Council, Gaudium et Spes in particular? How is the tradition resourcing right, what's uniquely Asian? So paper 96 that the Asian Bishops produced back in the year 2000 is entitled Method, Asian Christian Theology, Doing Theology in Asia Today. It's a lengthy 100-page document. It's a lengthy 100-page document uh, from the Office of Theological Concerns of the Federation of Asian Bishops. Uh, it took about three years to produce. Uh, it was heavily vetted. There were multiple authors contributing to it. Um, and it was produced by a cohort of members from Hong Kong, India, Indonesia, Japan, Korea, Malaysia, Nepal, Pakistan, Philippines, Sri Lanka, Taiwan, and Thailand, along with an invited European expert, um, George Evers. And it was approved in Kathmandu in the year 2000. Like all FADC papers, it was offered up to the Asian churches as a document for discussion. That's a little bit in my observation, unique for a bishop's conference to offer up a paper for discussion. Uh, and with the request that observations and criticisms be sent directly to the Hong Kong office of the Asian bishops. The document concludes by expressing hope that, I quote, this paper will be complemented and enriched by dialogue and interaction with theologies done in the churches of other continents. So rather than determining fixed theological methods or content or interpretation, they offered up a summary statement of contextual theology in Asia today, and then solicited exchange with Christian communities and other continents where the gospel grows in different but equally rich soil. Indeed, dialogue for them functions as the very method by which theology is life-giving and intelligible. 
I'm really attracted to this. I think that's a wonderful way for uh, a hierarchy uh, within a Christian community to style itself, to sort of put out its documents um, as conversation pieces. So, in terms of um, an experimental character, right, thinking of theology as having an experimental character, it's striking that as a document reporting on ancient theology and method, the Asian bishops characterized theology at the dawn of the new millennium as a task marked by a certain uh, experimental character, ambiguity, uncertainty, and tenuousness. So they're kind of referencing here the apophatic tradition. <clears throat> Our language doesn't quite capture the object. Their purpose does not appear to have been to relay Catholic doctrine or to offer a static picture of Asian theology or the theology of the Asian bishops, uh, or to set in place norms or criteria by which other attempts to formulate Asian theology should be measured. Uh, instead, the bishops' uh, writings do not carry juridical binding force. Uh, their acceptance is a form of collegiality. Uh, the goal was instead to shed some light on the emerging theological methods used by Asian theologians. In no way disciplinary or corrective, this document surveys an inherently dynamic enterprise within the Asian churches today, and underlines a distinctive and authentic way of being Christians from the bottom up. Attentive readers will hear the bishops convey worries that, in fact, they've not been well understood in Rome. Um, it's not by translation, but rather by enculturation. The bishops argue that Christian discipleship in Asia transforms lives through a living faith in Jesus Christ expressed from the depths of the Asian cycle. That's a quote from them, the depths of the Asian cycle. If you're hearing any kind of a post-colonial residue, uh, memory of, of a colonial period, you would be quite correct to, to do so. They're claiming Christian discipleship from their soil, not as some um, import. The language they use cannot be appreciated adequately without some orientation of the politics of identity, stemming from the histories of mission and colonialism in Asia, during which, according to Felix Wilfred, the great Indian theologian, uh, quote, the people of the continent were passive recipients of a message preached to them objects to be spiritually acted upon, end quote. Whereas Vatican II and Gaudium and Spes in particular offer an anthropology and view of culture according to which people are active agents uh, in the construction of their religious identity. Therefore, views of theology as translation, translating what is here for people who are over there, this disrespects the autonomy and the dignity of Asian Christians as persons. Whereas theology as enculturation respects the unique apprehension and the contribution to the enterprise these people are making. So the law of evangelization as a norm, this is a, almost a legal term, it sounds like. It's not. Uh, to this end, paper 96 opens with a provocative statement from Gary Spez. Um, this is section 44, for those of you who want, who want to check later tonight at home. Um, this is a section in Gary Spez that really legitimates and celebrates enculturation. I believe I have the statement for you. It's part of the length. The church is not unaware how much it's profited from the history and development of humankind. It profits from the experiences of past ages, from the progress of the sciences, from the riches, the riches hidden in various cultures through which greater light is thrown on the nature of humanity and new avenues to truth are opened up. The church learned early its history to express the Christian message in the concepts and languages of different peoples and tried to clarify it in the light of the wisdom of their philosophers. It was an attempt to adapt the gospel to the understanding of all people and the requirements of the learned insofar as this could be done. Indeed, this kind of adaptation and preaching of revealed word must ever be the law of all evangelization. 
So that phrase, law of evangelization, it simply means that the gospel has to resonate really and actually be used in terms of the cultural resources available on the ground for the given community in question. Evangelization ought not happen in some other way. It has to be indigenous. In this way, it's possible to create in every country the possibility of expressing the message of Christ in suitable terms and to foster vital contact and exchange between the church and different cultures. So I think they take this motif and, and want to run with it. And really, in a sense, the way that Gaudium and Spes offers this almost in a tacit manner, without really delving into examples, um, never sort of could have predicted the, the fecundity, the richness of actual examples in the world once we begin to, to look at them more closely. So the church's message from the beginning has been adapted to the understanding of all people specifically their cultural and linguistic frames of reference. Because the churches have always had a context, their message likewise has always been to some extent constructed or articulated anew from within indigenous frames of reference. So the idea that somehow the tradition is some assumed static entity that we can simply reference as objective, as if human history isn't involved, that doesn't quite seem to work well uh, for Vatican II or for the Asian bishops. They, the bishops build on this law of evangelization by noting how their own faith in Christ as Asians cannot be reduced merely to a translation from Western tongues into Asian tongues. They characterize their experience of faith in a really um, fascinating way for me uh, as the seed of the word falling into the rich soil of Asia. Their faith, what they experience. The seed of the word falling into the rich soil of Asia. This produces branches and fruit that may look and sound different than Western varieties, conveyed and explored through languages and cultures that resonate clearly and meaningfully. More organic, more bottom-up, and more integral than a process of translation, this Asian experience of Jesus comes from the depths of the Asian psyche and is intrinsic to them rather than an extrinsic experience at first by others and then shared, which Asians then appropriate through cultural media that is alien to them and therefore less resonant. The bishops testify that Christ meets them not as stranger but as St. Paul testifies, as one who lives and breathes these Christians into faith and transformation as the head of their body. So I think law of evangelization or enculturation, that's what's, that's what's at stake here. This is what they seem to be suggesting. And so the ecclesiological norm, right? How does the church, how should the church understand itself if enculturation is to be assumed uh, and celebrated for that matter. In the years following the Second Vatican Council, Karl Rahner, the great German Jesuit theologian, understood that the church could no longer, if it ever had, consider itself an ecclesial monoculture, ruled through Roman centralism, but should instead detach from a presumed normative cultural center. Detach from that even as it does reflect on particular cultural memories. The, the, the history of the West is really crucial, so don't deny it. Just maybe make room for what isn't Western. Everywhere in the world, Rahner maintains, the church should view itself as a diaspora church, consistent with the fact that the people of God comprise a global and polycentric community of witness. This is difficult, I think, for Catholics to really appreciate at times. Not a centralized ecclesial monoculture, but a community of witness. The people of God as a community of witness that is polycentric. There are many centers. 
While no doubt getting its spaz, section 44 paves the way conceptually for this kind of acculturation, uh, the world church nonetheless depends upon its members throughout the world, such as the FABC, to incarnate and live into this enculturation, which is signified as possible because it's actual with Vatican II. What the authors of Vatican II documents, as well as some in the church today, some authorities today, might not have been able to predict uh, or fully envision is the intense and sometimes bewildering dynamism between gospel and culture that exists on the ground right, once the seed of the word falls into that rich soil. Or the sheer fecundity of Christianities, emphasizing the plural of Christianities, that exist on the ground throughout the world, each representing unique responses to the one spirit of God. It's one thing to tacitly permit enculturation, but another to witness its dynamism, unpredictable terms, and another yet again for other centers of this polycentric church to be impacted by these so-called marginal and less familiar iterations of gospel and church. The dialogue which is always already occurring between gospel and cultures functions next as a model for dialogue that should transpire between the individual churches themselves, the diaspora churches. Dialogue among diaspora churches should be open and free, at times unsettling, interruptive, destabilizing, but ultimately humanizing, reconciling and supportive of authentic community and reciprocal learning. I suppose what I'm trying to say there is the church should not expect to be too neat. If humanity is inherently diverse, if the church is inherently diverse, uh, and if we are called to exchange and interaction and dialogue, we should expect differences. We don't need to be artificially homogenous as a church. More pointedly, perhaps, the, the metaphors of center and periphery give way to the humanizing reciprocity of encounter, human encounter and relationship among local churches, all of whom contribute vitally to the universal church precisely through generating meaning in their local context. This is the force of certain preferred terms the bishops use, like pluridimensional and multidimensional, uh, that these are ascribed to reality, but also to the community called church, and perhaps also to the experience of God pluridimensional, multidimensional. So that dialogue between gospel and culture, between local churches themselves, may profit from noting what the bishops call this pastoral, take care of this pastoral cycle, um, which they embrace, the Asian bishops embrace as their mode of proceeding. I think this is one strategy to have theology as dynamic and vital, and to resist um, what, what could be a kind of static quality to the theology enterprise, this pastoral cycle. As they describe it, the pastoral cycle gazes deeply into and interrogates various human and social contexts. It begins first with the experience of faith in Jesus. And this faith directs Christians into the world in solidarity and concern for all brothers and sisters. That's what faith is. This is a faith that moves swiftly from personal confession to public witness, uh, public witness and acts of solidarity. Faith becomes mission in this sense of the term. So they want to sort of rehabilitate that term mission that I think we in the West are almost uneasy with. Uh, for I think our Asian friends, mission is a way of life, a way of being with and for other people. It's not simply telling them what's true about God, what should be believed, and how it should be said. Mission is much more human, much more, much more kind of human encounter. Secondly, in the pastoral cycle, 
Secondly, mission requires rigorous analysis of the signs of the times. That famous Vatican II phrase, signs of the times. Right? And this commits the church to a churchly or a world, uh, a church world relationship of mutuality. Shunning a sectarian or world condemning view of mission. This revised understanding of mission prefers to engage in, excuse the Latin, prefers to engage in missio inter entes than missio ad entes. So, to translate it quite simply, mission for Christians shouldn't be mission to other peoples. Under the supposition that God had never encountered them already in the first place. But rather, mission between and among and with these other peoples. It's a much more humanizing way to understand mission. Missio inter entes. Mission with and between and among the other peoples. Relationships matter. That's what I hear them saying. And third, for this pastoral cycle, um, signs of the times may be disclosed by many non-theological sources of knowledge, like the sciences, like social psychology, like economics. But they become the subject of theological interpretation so that mission better addresses concrete needs as these communities find themselves in the thicket of history. Uh, in shorthand from the Indian Jesuit Michael Amalados, Theology is for life. Theology is for life. In this vision, the world functions as the scene where such faith is lived and engaged and becomes a source of life-giving knowledge and understanding that help Christians to retain a particular as context-specific understanding of mission as transformation of peoples and cultures. And this richly contextual vision of mission constitutes a significant Asian contribution to the world church by stressing particularly of faith in Jesus, number one. But number two, understood more as public witness than as private experience. More as transformation of unjust social structures and of wounded and impoverished lives than simple conversion to Christianity, kind of numbers can get more of them on our side. It's not what the mission should be about. This vision of mission rests comfortably with otherness and with a pluriform creation, with difference, with culture, with what is non-church. Comfortable with all these things. Aware and alert for how the one spirit of God may be moving among and within what is ostensibly non-Christian. And here they really are supreme Catholics, I think, because they're kind of talking about this non-church world um, deliberately in ways that destroy the whole notion that there is church and non-church. This is a sacramental spirituality, an incarnational spirituality, where the Spirit of God is active broadly, um, generously throughout the world. And what appears non-Christian can actually reveal the work of the God of Jesus Christ for those with eyes to see. So, what to do about this, right? Why, again, in a North American context, um, should this be of interest? There's going to be some tentative, I think, qualities to what I'm going to say, uh, but potentially also some gripes. And I'd love to be uh, called to account for my, my gripes and my issues. Um, or if you share them, please let me know. It'll make me feel better. I think, as many of us know, for the Catholic intellectual tradition, um, theology is marked by an analogical imagination, um, a both-and kind of approach methodologically, as opposed to an either-or approach. Okay, So that, that's kind of what I'm getting at here. Theology isn't about um, church against world. Uh, Christianity as opposed to religion X, Y, or Z. Uh, these are sort of false dichotomies. These are these are binary oppositions that are unhelpful. Um, and I think they seem to, this is me more speaking than they now, but I think they seem to be wanting to get this across. If the bishops enable a profoundly dialogical faith, it also enables 
they also enable a significantly broader and more inclusive vision of what theology is than we often acknowledge. What I mean is that the document resists what I would call binary oppositions that are false or misleading or pastorally insensitive. So, uh, Zian Cardinal Bruchaleski, uh, who is prefect for the Congregation for Catholic Education, a member of the Magisterium of the Catholic Church, he's a Polish cardinal <clears throat> who spoke at length on this topic in his inaugural address at a conference on Vatican II that I attended in South India earlier this year. And in this talk that the Cardinal gave, he lamented what he called um, the antitheses, the antitheses which ironically mark the landscape of Catholic theology today, as if to require a facile choice between simplistic identity markers like conservative or progressive local or universal, continuity versus discontinuity. Binary oppositions such as these purvey the, the misapprehension that an either-or relationship between the terms is fitting, and that antagonistically, one pole of that divide inhabits error, while the other one inhabits truth. These antitheses are ironic in a Catholic context because the Catholic intellectual tradition offers the synthesis of an analogical imagination, or what the Cardinal said, Catholicity, right? as the more fruitful interpretive key by which the diversity of human experience can be included and reconciled. I would get more specific in terms of some examples of these binary oppositions. Um, I would name them as the, the opposition between identity and otherness. Identity and otherness. The opposition between orthodoxy and heterodoxy. You can choose heresy if you like that term better. Mm -hmm. Orthodoxy or orthopraxis. Right doctrine, right belief, or right action. Typically, my experience, and please share yours, but my experience in the West is that we are vulnerable to view these relationships as mutually opposed, to be fixated on one pole, but not the other. But rather than see them as relationships of harmony, right, that privilege an integrative or a both-and sensibility, rather than a separative or either-or sensibility. The binary mentality can be preferable for those who wish to impute a degree of stability and control on theological content and methods that one hopes help to convey clear and pedagogically simple statements of faith and criteria for orthodoxy. But I think such clarity and distortion of theology through which the clarity is achieved frequently is unable to deliver on certain pastoral benefits. So that binary mentality can be easier to maintain for those who want order and obedience and catechesis, religious teaching. Rather than theological development, transformative praxis, and enculturation. But I think we lose something in church, we lose something in theology when we think we can manage it or control it, determine it fix it in static ways. I think we've lost something critical about that. This is where that pastoral cycle, right? the pastoral cycle includes a stipulation which can safeguard a vision of theology as open and searching and responsive rather than closed, fixed, and static. So that pastoral cycle of faith in Jesus and then analysis of the signs of the times right? and then reflection on those signs of the times they ask for that cycle to repeat itself continuously. It's an unending process. We don't just do it once and we're done. It's a, um, it's a process that continues and there's no exit match. We constantly undergo that faith experience. We constantly undergo 
analysis of signs of the times. And we constantly uh, uh, pursue uh, non-theological sources as conversation partners. Repetition of the cycle creates better conditions for the possibility of the gospel resonating meaningfully and transformatively. It's a living theology, it's a vision of theology as unending, as moving, and it's sensitive. I think this matters for me. It's sensitive to the ongoing signs of our times. Is the ice cream truck arrived? <laughs> <laughs> Now this might sound kind of ho-hum and method and so what, but I think actually there's a, there's a theological principle at stake here that's very important in my view, and that would be um, a doctrine of the Holy Spirit or, or pneumatology. A pneumatology is at stake in what they are getting at, their stress on paying attention to context, context, context. What I mean is this, if contextual realities become signs of the times and are therefore to be exposed to rigorous analysis, this has to include a revision of what contextual realities are. No longer minimized as the mere backdrop against which theology occurs, as though they're extrinsic to theology. Uh, but rather, these contextual realities are resources for theology. They're their loci theologica, resources for theology, alongside of scripture, alongside of tradition, alongside of experience, alongside of the magisterium. I mean, just think about that for a second. Your, your favorite social psychologist, whoever it is, could be a resource taken seriously alongside of scripture, tradition, church teachings, human experience. Or your favorite evolutionary biologist, or wherever you gain interesting wisdom that can interface with Christian understanding. For the Asian bishops, these, these include the religious resources in Asia, the Hindu scriptures, the Buddhist scriptures, etc. They include social movements such as women's movements. Uh, if you follow the news at all in India, this really matters today. Lives are at stake, lives are being lost because of wrong views of women and women's bodies. Ecological movements are part of this. And especially for the Asian bishops, any movement that shines a light on the immensity of Asia's poor. In all of these examples, the theological criterion established to legitimate these contextual realities is, quote, that they create an alternative society that is just, humane, participatory, caring, and compassionate, where humanization and reconciliation are evident in relationships, and where humanization and reconciliation is evident, there we find the spirit of God at work. So identity versus alterity. I'm currently on time, David. Do I want to give way to Joe here pretty quick? Uh, yeah, as soon as you can. Sure. Okay. We're fine. We're fine. Yeah. This identity versus otherness or alterity, I'm fascinated with how they describe it. Because for these Asian Christians, Christianity is a marginal religious option. It's fractional uh, among, among Asian people across the Asian continent and subcontinent. A very small minority of, of, of people are, are Christians. That means that they have reflexively Hindu and Buddhist and Taoist and Confucian cultural heritages that, if you think about it, can't simply be checked at the door of Christian discipleship. Um, these people have to find some way to integrate what is simply in the air that they breathe, the water that they drink, um, the history that they inherit, the families that they inherit. They have to have some way to 
to embrace what is culturally already theirs. So this difference between identity and otherness is a false difference for them. Their identity is plural. As Christians, they take seriously Hindu teachings. They take seriously Hindu texts, or the Buddha, or Buddhist texts. This is a not, a not an activity that they try to do. It just happens spontaneously for them, and it empowers it empowers their Christianity. It's not a challenge. So their heritage and history and culture need not be relinquished, but embraced and fulfilled in discipleship. So the extent to which I'm Christian means I'm proportionally not Hindu, or not Islamic, or not Buddhist. That zero-sum game approach just, just doesn't resonate. It's not meaningful. It's not a meaningful way to understand religious identity. I want to suggest that for us, this needs attention. In both the academic arena, where simplistic theologies of religions are studied and discussed in abstraction from their religious traditions and the communities they mean to judge, as well as at the popular grassroots level, where religions are frequently viewed in fearful or otherizing and inhospitable ways, the insecurity that leads one to define self and community in contrasted rather than integrative terms, this needs attention. We need to find some way to think of ourselves as hybrids, um, to be less threatened by what's different. Because in fact, we are hybrids. Better to reconcile with the fact than to pursue a kind of mirage purity that never was the case in the first place. Orthodoxy as opposed to heterodoxy. Here I'll be very brief, but uh, the Vatican has been quite concerned. I think many of us know this. In the last maybe 15 or 20 years, that in Asia there's a growing conviction of pluralism among Christians, and that this would seem to threaten proper views of Jesus Christ as unique and of the church as unique. The Asian bishops are quite aware of the disadvantages of, 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 a, of a relativism. But they want to say that, look, Vatican, what you say about us that is relativistic, you accuse us of being relativistic, we're instead pluralists, not relativists. And by pluralism, they simply mean that reality is plural dimensional and that there are various perspectives human communities in history have on reality or God. Because both reality and human perception are perspectival, it makes sense to hold one's views in dialogue with the views of others. They recommend a vision of reality and theological truth that is communitarian, dialogical, and even pneumatological. A vision of sacred reality best appreciated in a community of commitment and dialogue and openness. They find support for this in Gaudium et Spes, the Vatican II document, which celebrates the, the legitimate diversity of the church. And if for some of us we still have problems with pluralism or think that it's relativism, the bishops are sort of coy here. Um, they cite Thomas Aquinas, or Thomas, um, and his argument that um, the act of faith terminates not in the expression of that faith, but in the reality itself, God. The act of faith terminates not in the expression of that faith, but in the object of that faith, the reality itself, who our language and conceptual talents don't touch. That's good warrant, I think, for the position. Thomas's apophatism. And finally, orthopraxis and orthodoxy. Uh, I'm going to be stupidly brief here, so pardon me, but uh, I want to sort of bring this home even more, more directly now uh, to reference the bishops of this country, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. And um, what I would suggest 
is a regrettable public and uh, pastoral um, image that we currently have. Uh, I want to refer to the investigations, the recent investigations of the Leadership Conference of Women Religious, our nuns, uh, as well as the Professor Elizabeth Johnson's book from Fordham, uh, Quest for the Living God, and the U.S. Bishop's political advocacy against same-sex marriage, as well as contraceptive coverage in health care insurance. Now you're wondering, oh my gosh, how did he get here? <laughs> what are we doing now? Um, but the U.S. bishops have been extraordinarily focused on defending their sense of orthodox faith against new developments and possibilities in the public sphere they deem incompatible with faith. And while it's unlikely that these issues can be resolved easily and in the same way, and while my presentation does not intend to advocate clear resolutions or alternatives to this set of ecclesial teachings and use of authority, I think the Asian bishops might offer a more productive way forward. While first indicating that they begin, the Asian bishops, with sacred tradition and scripture in their theological method, the Asian bishops move promptly to those Asian realities that are crucial for them, and that these Asian realities should function as resources for theological method. And they confess, the Asian bishops do, that this signals a tremendous change in theological methodology. One last quote, if I can trouble you. No, I didn't do it. Apologies. I'll simply read it. This is a quote from the Asian document. The cultures of peoples, the history of their struggles, their religions, their religious scriptures, oral traditions, popular religiosity, economic and political realities and world events, historical persons, stories of oppressed peoples crying for justice, freedom, dignity, life, and solidarity, these all become resources for theology and assume methodological importance in our context. Now, if I were being flippant, I might, I might sort of challenge the bishops of my own country to make a similar statement and then to back it up by letting this human experience from the grassroots bubble up and begin to inform theological reflection of the bishops themselves. This is a vision of church eagerly awaiting testimony from the spirit in the world's marginalized and forgotten least and its people, their experiences of oppression and degradation. This is a vision of church that confesses its own need to watch for traces of the spirit moving in and through the world extra ecclesial outside the church. Artificial distinction alert. The spirit moving outside of the church. And it's a vision of church that can't rest easily with forms of authority and control that seek to quiet these eruptions from below. So to conclude, this intersection of enculturation and pneumatology, where the Asian bishops found themselves, can be viewed today not only as a transformative mission and practice for Asian peoples, but also a new contribution to the meaning of guiding its best for our consideration here in this country. Where necessary, where necessary, Christians the world over can learn from the Asian style, from contextual realities, and from the humility that they seem to have and which they use to communicate their theological understanding. Where and when such conditions occur, let us bring the margins to the center and learn from those whose experiences may reach beyond their original context to be transformative for others. Uh, in so doing, we learn that the church enjoys no real or fixed position of center and margin, but with Rahner, would be best understood in all places as a diaspora church, a polycentric community of witness, called to dialogue and destined for reconciliation. So thank you very much. Well, we do want to get to discussion. Uh, Joe Mudd is going to uh, provoke us here a bit uh, with some comments.
thank you, John, for these reflections. I think they're very helpful and thought-provoking and stimulating for discussion. And thanks to all of you. So for being here, uh, it is a lovely Friday afternoon. And I know I stand between you and happy hours. So, <laughs> so by way of response to Dr. Shevlin, I want to raise three points. The first point is methodological. The second is pneumatological, dealing with the Holy Spirit. And the third is ecclesiological. So first, method, methodical theology in a global context. In the introduction to method and theology, Bernard Lonergan writes, quote, when a classicist notion of culture prevails, theology is conceived as a permanent achievement, and then one discourses on its nature. When culture is conceived empirically, theology is known to be an ongoing process, and then one writes on its method, end quote. In the classicist horizon, there is culture and there is barbarism. Culture is civilization. There is a civilized center and a barbaric periphery. There is sameness and there is otherness. But when culture is conceived empirically, those divisions fall away. The center is everywhere. Culture is understood anthropologically. And civilization is understood sociologically. Hybridity is a concrete reality. The Second Vatican Council began to speak in terms of a concrete notion of culture, recognizing that the Christian faith is not beholden to one culture, and is in fact adaptable to many cultures within certain limits set by Revelation. See paragraph 44, cited by Dr. Shepard. If classicism began to fade in the 20th century, it still has deep roots, nonetheless, in mission territories. Because for much of its history, the classicist cultural ideal shaped missionary practice. As a result, as many have observed, Christian missionaries preached European culture as much as they preached the gospel. What makes the cases of some remarkable Jesuits so noteworthy to us and made them so scandalous to their contemporaries was that they resisted the classicist paradigm of the potato issue regarding the novel. Despite these in instances of authentic enculturation, there remains a tendency toward classicism among some theologians and church authorities today. But the desire to move beyond the, the strictures of a classicist mentality and theology has met with varied results. There tend to be, for example, theological experiments of a more progressive orientation that attempt to speak in ways adapted to contemporary cultures, but with relatively little attention to a dogmatic theological context. This manner of proceeding often leads others of a more conservative orientation to argue that theology simply comments on magisterial texts, full stop. But if theologians are responsible for mediating an encounter between the gospel and particular cultures, an adequate method is critical. Such a method would move beyond the dialectic of identity and alterity, but it would do so by grounding its operations in a transcultural paradigm and in dogmatic affirmation. Lonergan elaborates a transcultural paradigm in his masterwork Insight in terms of generalized empirical method. Generalized empirical method is grounded in the operations of conscious intentionality, which include experiencing, understanding, judging, deciding, and loving. Incorporating generalized empirical method into what he calls a methodical theology, reorients, therefore, theological foundations. Methodical theology resists the idea that foundations are to be found first in propositions, which are always formulated within a particular cultural discourse, and instead identifies foundational reality as the horizon of intellectual, moral, and religious conversion. Foundation is a person, not a concept. You can try to prove the foundations of concepts. It therefore takes the cultural experience of Christians seriously as a locus for theological reflection. Further, because no individual, even when operating in the context of conversion, possesses all the relevant questions, methodical theology is necessarily dialogical. It's always a collaborative enterprise. The foundation is a single person. You're going to get to all the relevant questions. You can't ask them all. If you were God, you could. A further specification of the kinds of questions relevant to theological reflection would identify collaboration and dialogues in terms of functional specializations as opposed to field specializations. This might be a little bit of inside baseball for those of us who do theology in the academy, but you might. The tendency among many theologians at present is to place interreligious dialogue or intercultural encounter as a specialized field within theology. This, I think, is what Dr. Shevlin was saying about being a curiosity to be tolerated. There are, for example, moral theologians, systematic theologians, biblical theologians, etc. And then there are comparative theologians. So, Dr. Shellen is a comparative theologian. 
That's a, an artificial characterization. So as a result of that way of thinking, of field specialization, comparative theology is often isolated or a curiosity or an afterthought. But in a functionally specialized methodical theology, especially in its mediated phase, which begins with the foundational reality of the subject, theological reflection begins with experience. Contextual reality of the theologian is therefore foundation. So I think methodical theology sort of handles some of the concerns that, that Shevlin has raised in his paper. So to recognize that, that foundations are in persons is simply to affirm, as Pope Francis did in the week to La in a letter this week to La Republica, there are no free-floating absolute truths. This is critical for Christians. Instead, truth resides in persons in the form of judgments. For Christians, for example, the truth is found in Christ Jesus. It doesn't sit out there floating around. Somewhere. It's there in the person. Once we affirm the truth resides in persons, particularity is foregrounded in the binary of identity and alterity really just dis disappears. So the second point is pneumatology. First, I want to offer a defense of orthodoxy as a category. Though it is a hallmark of modern thinking to be dogma dogmatically opposed to dogmas, we may not want to be too timid in, our, in defending orthodoxy against distortions, precisely because orthodoxy is what makes real dialogue possible. You have to take a position to have a conversation. Concern for orthodoxy is not equivalent to opposing openness or dialogue. For example, we, we might want to argue that it is heter heterodox ecclesiology that imagines the church as a closed society. Concern for orthodoxy is therefore methodologically critical for dialogue, but it is also necessary for theoretical understanding of dogma. There are, for example, very important dogmatic reasons for resisting theologies of process, however. Such theologies are prone to thinking about grace and providence in terms of a developing divine horizon. That would include the possibility of divine afterthoughts. The pastoral results can be disastrous. Imagine, for example, a priest who, embracing an implicitly voluntarist image of God, tells his congregation that God removes sanctifying grace when you sin and withholds it until you go to confession and receive absolution. Or imagine a preacher who talks about God looking down at the mess of history and deciding to send the Son to fix it. These are very common homiletic tropes. I've actually heard both of these were homilies. This is not made up. But they're distortions. We may even be justified in calling them heretical. Their being wrong, however, is not known at the level of common sense preaching or piety. Only in the horizon of theory are their errors clarified. Dogmas, after all, deal in theory. But dogmas don't preach well. Nevertheless, dogmatic clarifications on questions concerning the impassibility of God or the eternality of the mission of the Word are critical because they enable authentic theological dialogue not simply doctrinal period. Now this leads me to consider a pneumatological response to the kind of flagrant appeal to orthodoxy as a law that preempts openness and dialogue, which I think is really Dr. Shevlin's concern. So Shevlin's indicated that Asian Christians embrace a pluralism that is not relativistic. And this is important. Pluralism is a fact. The goal should be to understand why it exists and what it actually is. There may even be good historical and indeed theological reasons for maintaining the confusion. I think such a claim actually inhibits dialogue because dialogue is either about something or it's about nothing. I don't think those engaged in dialogue imagine they're talking about nothing. No, they're talking about something. And that something is reality, truth. So I would want to modify that claim that both reality and human perception are perspectival and say, yes, knowing is perspectival, but reality is one thing. See St. Thomas Aquinas, Summa Theologus, Ephemus of Healing, cited by Dr. Schoen. Reality exists despite our perceptions. We are always gone like that. We're pretty sure I am still cosmos. There are some philosophers who would say, well, you don't. But they'd have a hard time talking to us. So allow me to clarify the point by turning to, to pneumatology. Commonly, we think of the mission of the Word preceding the mission of the Spirit. After all, the Nativity precedes the Pentecost of the narrative. That is our perspective on the events depicted in the New Testament. 
The late Canadian Jesuit Frederick Crow, a longtime collaborator and expositor of modern, proposed that we also ought to think of the order of the divine missions and the order of being. In the order of knowing, the Son comes first and then the Spirit. The disciples experience the Son and then experience the Spirit. In the order of being, the Spirit is sent and then the Son. The work of the Son depends on the preparation of the Spirit. The seed of the Word requires the tilling of the Spirit if it is to take root in the soul. Indeed, Scripture tells us that no one can call Christ Lord except by the power of the Holy Spirit. And further, no one comes to the Son unless the Father draws him. The Father's drawing, by the way, is nothing other than the Holy Spirit. The Father doesn't have other tools. The entire transitus of the Son unfolds as one work by which God the Father mediates relationship with human beings. The substance of that relationship is the third person of the Trinity. The love of God is the Holy Spirit poured into our hearts as unconditioned gift. The inner word that is the gift of the Spirit is that by which we recognize in the Son the outer word of love sent by the Father. Only love knows love. By clarifying the orders of knowing and being, we are able to affirm a strong pneumatology that enables dialogue with others as a dialogue in the Spirit. Working out an adequate dogmatic theological context that takes into account that ontological ordering is critical because it will include pluralism of expression from the get. And you're starting one step before you get to the uniqueness of the sun. And so we would have some differences maybe in the way that we was presented. There is one unique thing with the Christian community that's this hard to be in. We can have a lot of conversations In that I'm happy to argue. I'm happy to have people argue. So an adequate pneumatology takes us beyond the binary of orthodoxy and heterodoxy, even while affirming orthodoxy in terms of an authentic witness to reveal truth known by the Spirit. So I don't want to abandon orthodoxy. It's a critical um, perspective. It generally doesn't work very well because it corresponds to theoretical clarification, which is not what we are usually Ecclesiology as orthopraxis. Throughout his brief pontificate, Pope Francis has erred on the side of orthopraxis. In a series of public comments, he has urged his audiences to take risks in assuming the evangelical mission of the church by heading to the margins, experimenting, making mistakes, and disturbing the settled routine of the church for the sake of the gospel. An overweening concern for orthodoxy, by contrast, can be paralleled. So if I've defended orthodoxy in the previous section, I would like I would also readily admit that orthodoxy is all too frequently invoked in order to avoid risking the scandal. But being church is never first a matter of assenting to propositions and then act. Rather, Christian discipleship acts out of an experience of love for a concrete person. And loving our neighbors concretely in history is messy. To be Christian is to embody a liberative praxis of reconciliation in the midst of sin, the sinful structures that enslave humanity. Indeed, the church carries on the work of the Trinitarian missions in history through such practice. So that's the substance of the church. One way of identifying those missions, what I consider to be the best way, is to think of them in terms of mediations of friendship. The Father sent the Son and the Spirit to mediate friendly relations with human beings who are estranged from God. The church is called to imitate these missions by befriending those suffering in sin and those suffering the effects of sin, those who experience themselves as being unlovable or as unloved. In order to mediate that meaning, the church is called to go to the margins, to the frontiers, and whenever possible, the church is called to collaborate with those who speak a word of love, a word of the Spirit, regardless of their religious affiliation in the midst of sin and suffering, for whoever is not against us is for us. Within that liberative praxis, questions of orthodoxy therefore recede to the background, if perhaps only momentarily. They may reemerge, but they need not preempt encounter for fear of getting messy. One final ecclesiological point follows. It is the responsibility of the local church to determine what kinds of partnerships facilitate liberative praxis. 
Therefore, the principle of subsidiarity holds not only in civil society, but in the church as well. Local churches have a better understanding of their particular contexts and have the capacity to judge whether partnerships with others present real concerns for orthodoxy. They may not. They may. The criteria for that judgment are not found in any book or magisterial text. Rather, the authenticity of the local church will guide engagement and ultimately orthodoxy as well. This statement simply affirms that in addition to an ecclesiology of communion that binds the church ad intra, the Second Vatican Council also employs an ecclesiology of friendship that calls to the church to mission ad extra. Lumen Gentium deals with the church ad intra, guidance as deals with the church ad extra. This can be a little more efficient. So to summarize briefly, I've raised three points in response to the problematic binaries Dr. Shevlin explained. I think they refer to real theological and pastoral problems. How they might be solved is, is a matter for further conversation. What I have proposed are what I take to be possibly relevant ways of thinking through the binaries, getting beyond them, perhaps a bit of the alien synthesized categories. I may be asking if really in the end there are binaries at all. You guys want to stay up there, or yeah. yeah? So, questions, comments, and you guys can field as you as you wish. Okay. Uh, John, Joe, uh, the dialogue of culture—it's it's always uh, seemed a bit. Uh, my reflection on it is with a witch culture in pluralistic societies such as America or India. Very diverse. India is far more diverse than America. To speak of Indian culture seems to be just false. Uh, the subcontinent is sort of different, culturally diverse and rich. And furthermore, cultures change or uh, evolve, whatever you want to say. So what would be quintessentially, say, American culture or quintessentially the culture of um, some one of the states of India? So how is this dialogue approach a moving target? And it seems to me sometimes that in the ecclesial statements or theological statements, uh, this is glided over uh, as if we have a, a reality that's well understood and that's relatively stable uh, and not uh, full of uh, multiple currents and conflicts. So right off the bat, I'm not sure I understand the other adequate uh, language to appreciate that in, these, in some of the ecclesial and theological documents. It seems an ideal picture is drawn, and there's a culture out there. It might be something like Asian culture, which I put to this probably very misleading, or something called American culture. And these are multicultural societies and realities. Well, I just say, you know, briefly, I think um, I, I don't see the Asian bishops going um, too much into detail as to which cultures they want to be uh, in dialogue with. It's not just Asian culture, that's a misnomer, obviously, it's cultures. Um, but I think their, their agenda, um, and this is where it's, there's some edge to it, um, is really to say, look, Rome is fundamentally misconstruing us. Um, there's a breakdown of relationship. Um, and there's a kind of monitoring or, or managing of the Asian church that even during a papal visit, uh, these Asian bishops are feeling like they're being managed. So it's not so much that they're trying to outline specific cultures that do and don't amount to uh, loci theologicae, source, resources for theology. It's almost prior to that, a kind of plea for space to actually have the particularities of Asian cultures um, inflect meaning and form and shape to um, their expression of discipleship. Yeah, I, th I think my part of the tension is that what I would see as a residual notion of classicism that would, that would say there's American culture, there's Indian culture, there's European culture. 
once you get to a concrete notion of culture, you're getting way down deep on the ground. You're talking about Gonzaga culture, Catherine Monica culture, right? So it's, it's really specific when you're being empirical. And that's where, where theologians need to be in dialogue with the social sciences and anthropology in order to have an adequate understanding of what culture is. Otherwise, it is a term that's very it's problematized in sort of post-critical theory is this, this category that gets thrown onto. It's an elastic term. Yeah. But if it's, if it's a concrete, you know, we can start to elaborate what goes into a culture. Repeatable patterns of behavior, just to think of basically. There are cultures of, in, a, in a classroom. This, the Socratic club is a culture. I don't, yeah, I don't mean to get I wouldn't ask any pretty vicious or anybody else to do that particularly. But, uh, I wonder if you two, if my worry there was a mistake, or if you, if you would see that as a plausible issue in these statements. Yeah. I think it's a real issue. For me, it's a real issue. Um, and part of the problem, the way it's, it's used a little bit like you're describing in, in the Attica too, both in the document on the liturgy and in the Attica Spence, where you can kind of see that, that remnant of, of a sort of classicist mentality saying there's this culture, or there's Asian culture, and then there's American culture. Um, and that can enable you to sort of resist the very specific kinds of enculturation that emerge once you open that box. Um, so I think there needs to be further clarification. And I think cooperation with sociologists and anthropologists, which don't see a lot among theologians or well, we'll, we'll move you guys over to college hall. <laughs> we probably need it. I think the question may have been not answered in the commentary, but it, it sounds very nice to say, well, culture has Buddhist and Hindu scriptures which are part of the cultural world people live, and that should be respected and taken into account. The problem is that I grew up as a marginalized Catholic in a largely non-Catholic environment. I was a Catholic in Utah. 700,000 Mormons, 50,000 of us, and we were the largest non-Mormon religion in the state. We're just really small. And I, I keep, let's substitute Book of Mormon for Hindu and Buddhist scriptures. Now trust me on this. The Book of Mormon idea of God is so far wrong from even, forget Catholic, even general Christian points of view, that there really isn't any legitimation of, its, of a just and culture. But if you had, within Utah, a whole bunch of Mormons who converted to Christianity, who started saying, but well, we've got to be able to bring the scriptures of the Book of Mormon into our Catholicism, you should throw them out of the church. That's what you should do. They believe there is a multiplicity of gods, that each planet has its own god. And God the Father has a father, and God the Father's father has a father. And I try to do an infant regress on them, and they don't even understand what an infant regress argument is. So there's got to be a limit on the good sounding stuff, like we should respect the Hindu and Buddhist scriptures. What's the limit? Yeah, so, you know, what they don't do in this document is give you concrete examples of where a Christian can glean from the Bhagavad Gita Christic elements or seeds of the word. They're actually focused more on um, the notion that there are Asian hermeneutical uh, strategies that can be used for Christians. Uh, so it's more about a kind of prior question of just permitting um, the possibility of, of these other texts already doing what they're doing, which is informing how incarnation is understood. So when a, when a Christian in India um, understands the Gospel of John and what you know, the descent of the word actually means. Um, reflexively, culturally, he or she is not going to be unable to think Bhagavad Gita and Krishna. Um, so there's a kind of hybridity there, even if this person is saying Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. There still is a hybridity 
um, at least at the level of culture um, that is relevant there. And, and this is not to say that somehow Gospel of John and Gita are parallel in truth. I mean, they're just not really doing that. They want space to do what they're already doing, which is to be Christians as Indians. Um, I think the Mormon analogy is a bit of a disanalogy. Uh, well, I just substituted the Book of Mormon for yeah. Hindu texts. That's yeah. all I did. Yeah. And I thought, you don't want to go this route. Trust me, I live there. You don't want to go this route. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a difference, though, in the sense that the Book of Mormon takes Christian revelation as foundational for its body of text. Uh, Christian revelation as reinterpreted by Joseph. That's right. So you're within the Christian tradition. So it's a no, different no, set as, of questions. As reinterpreted, then the reinterpretation ain't what you see in the normal Sure. Life. But they're claiming that they're within the Christian understanding. And so you raise different kinds of questions. But the Bhagavad Gita is so far outside of that horizon that it's not. The comparison doesn't quite work for me either. I understand your concern, on the other hand, that... No, I'm the, just concerned with the way the statement's made. There, there's got to be a limit somewhere. Yeah, I would say the limit is Christ. Is this more yeah, the, well, the, sure, the way in which Christ can be understood, um, and if you've got Indian cultural categories as opposed to Greco-Roman cultural categories, the notion that Christ is guru, guru, that's deeply meaningful. It's not some sort of sellout. It's actually mm -hmm. a kind of meaningful way to appropriate who Christ is um, as unique. Um, so I think there. It's not so much this and this, and they're both true or or what have you. It's there is one truth for us. It's the truth of Christ, and we we conceive of it in uniquely Asian ways. Is this sort of a, is there Asian bishops view more of trying to learn and understand your audience to properly deliver your message? I think that would be the Asian bishops view of what Rome looked like. Um, so, Edmund Chia, um, a great Malaysian theologian, has sort of done a study of what happened after John Paul II went to Delhi, India, and then prom promulgated Ecclesia in Asia, the church in Asia. Um, there, his observation was that really what you have is John Paul II looking at Asia as a field for harvesting new souls for Christ. Um, despite all of his sort of momentous achievements with interreligious dialogue, he's sort of got a default position of Christ was Asian, very few Asians today are Christian, this is a disconnect and it should be repaired. Right, so, whereas the Asians are saying evangelization in Asia looks like living with and for our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, whether they're Hindu or Buddhist. Jane. Because I know they're having traveled to the area. Uh, their mindset their mindset of somehow I'm trying to generalize Asia and Rio. They're going to have just their culture, their world, their mindset is different. And grasping different languages and translating it and not getting lost in translation and trying to relate relating to another book and trying to is impressed with it. And part of what I hear sort of the, the Asian theologians and bishops suggesting in response to Rome is that look, it's not just about <clears throat> message delivery and reception. It's personal, it's it's human lives that are already pluralistic. Right. So we, we don't want to better understand Indian cultures or you know, Chinese or Confucian cultures so as to better preach. We want to understand them so as to better live out our Christian discipleship from where we stand all the way. That's in a Confucian culture or an Indian culture. Or yeah. I think it's, per, it's personalized. We think of it in terms of message and perception. They think of it in terms of integrating their lives. That's, I think, for me, that's where I'm really interested. That's very powerful. Yeah, sure. I do agree with that. Yeah. We're a little over time. Maybe one more question. 
But years ago, and I haven't read for ages, Helica wrote a book, uh, Jesus Through the Centuries. Five of them. Pardon you? <laughs> oh, no, that's his history, sorry. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Jesus, and so the, if I read that book, it was kind of somewhat might be useful to think about here. Uh, Western civilization wasn't all in one piece. It's, it's a story of change and so on. So the image of Jesus keeps changing. This is a story amongst the devout over the centuries. The culture, the wider culture that people live in, uh, changes. And so the, the image of Jesus that becomes dominant in the art, in the, uh, in the prayer life of the church, evolves, changes, whatever. And it's to what John just said, so that that voice of conversion, calling this conversion inside our sweet selves, is heard. But Jesus, the image of Jesus in um, the fourth century, and the image of Jesus in the um, 19th century, artistically don't look much like that as it did. There's a whole different culture there between those two parts of Western civilization. Not a whole different culture, but significant culture. So it would seem to me that's a kind of charter, or kind of instance rather, of culture and Christian faith inter intermingling with one, inevitably. And in the Western experience itself. Yeah, there's a sense in which we forget that the Western experience was enculturated over and over from the get-go. You know, as soon as people start heading north, well, even in Galilee, well, multicultural and, and reality. Even, even today, as we all rumble around with globalization and consumer and culture, we are far from understanding how to evangelize just now. Yeah. Thank you both. Thank you. Yeah, let's thank our speakers. Uh, again, if you'd like to be kept up with events of the Socratic Club, there's an email sign up. I don't send out very many. You won't, I won't fill your inbox with spam. It's just occasional messages about uh, our monthly meetings. Thanks again for coming. Grab a snack on your way out. Hope to see you uh, next, next month then.